Thank you very much, Alan. So yes, yeah, so now you're all feeling full, I hope. That was a lovely lunch. Thank you, EPA. Um, uh, and my job is to try and keep you all awake, number one, in this slightly dark room, and hopefully give a little bit uh, of inspiration. But I might also just kind of call back to some of the things that I think resonated with me throughout the morning, and that might help us to kind of carry some of those key themes um, through into our afternoon discussion. Have I got those slides? Yep, they're coming. Um, so what I wanted to start with is a word, change. So I want you to stick your hand up in the air if when you think of the word change, it makes you excited and think positive thoughts. Hmm, good, lots of optimists. Now put your hand up in the air if when you think change, it creates fear and anxiety. Okay. So we have more optimists than pessimists in the room. So change is important. We're here talking about climate change. We're here talking about how to change Ireland. We're talking about behavioural change. How do we change people and their habits, some of the hardest things in the world to change. So change means to make or become different. And what I want to emphasise here is different doesn't mean better or worse or neutral. It just means different. So I think a lot of what's holding us back from making change is a fear that different is going to be better. For some reason, we are completely protective of the here and now as the best yet we have homelessness and inequality. We have 600 pe uh, 1,600 people a year dying from air pollution. Like, what are we so hung up on protecting this? It can be better. So I love in the noun definition, so an actor process through which something becomes different sounds quite neutral, but look at the next one. A new or refreshingly different experience. That's what I think climate action could be. A new or refreshingly different experience. So I get my new and refreshingly different experiences in the summer months by swimming in the sea. As you heard, stay sane, if I am sane. Um, and it was one morning after a swim in this sea that um, this girl called Madeleine came charging up the slipway after me. And I've since worked with Madeleine for over a year. So I now know that when she gets a bee in her bonnet, she doesn't let it lie until she sorts it out. And her bee in her bonnet on this particular morning after our swim around Sandy Cove Island outside Kinsale was, why is there no green team for me? Her son had been on the green team in school, learning great things about how to reduce his carbon footprint and recycle properly for over three years. And the first thing she found out about it was at an award ceremony that she was invited along to. And she's like, I make all the decisions in the family. I decide who, which utility bill, what car, which food, how it's cooked, whether we drive or we walk, whether we buy, cycle or not. I make all those decisions. Why is nobody educating me? the decision maker right now. And why are we waiting for our kids to grow up to change the world? We can start to change the world already. Um, so why don't we get on with it? And then as we started working together, the IPCC report came out and she's like, oh my God, so little time. You know, my eight year old kid will be 18 by the time we have to have transformed the world. As he says to me, mom, I won't even, I won't even be finished school. You know, he's scared about this future that we're telling him about. And that really worries me, this emotional, um, weight that we're passing on to our kids every single day. So I'm so excited about the, the climate marches. I'm so excited to see our youth animated. But I also think it's not fair. They didn't cause this problem. When we have 10 years, we are not going to waste uh, leaving it for them to do. We have to get on and do something. So then I learned something. I'd spent the last 20 years hopping on and off airplanes, advising people internationally on how to save the planet. And uh, I was just about deciding that I'd, had a, I'd really wanted to kind of get stuck in on something in my own community for a change and create change within my own neighborhood and my own town. And so Madeline and I, on the fruits of her being in her bonnet, uh, we set up Plastic Free Kinsale. And the first lesson I took from that is just start something. Stop thinking about it. Don't wait for the perfect moment to come along. We just started. Um, and starting something was refreshing, and starting something was exciting. And what you find is if you start people and something and you ask people for help, they help you. Um, it's really not that complicated. And so we decided that it wasn't our kids' job to fix this, and we decided that plastics at that time, at the beginning of 2018, was a really good gateway issue to get people engaged with. That we'd start with that, but we'd come around to the more complex issues associated with um, climate change along the way. And we were right, plastic was a great place to start, and it allowed us to learn an awful lot about how you make change at the community level. And partway through this, I thought, well, if I'm going to do this properly, I better upskill a little bit. 
so I applied for a program called Homer Bound. Uh, it's a global program for women in science, and I was lucky to be the first woman living in Ireland to get selected to go to Antarctica. Um, and that whole program is highlighting the fact that we need to bring all of the leadership we can to the table to solve the, the world's problems. And that up until now, we have over relied on men's leadership within that, and that surely a greater diversity wouldn't be a bad thing. So we are five female speakers to 18 men today. Um, so we st clearly still have some way to go, but all of this learning um, is to try and figure out how we change the way we do leadership on planet Earth in every country. There's no country that's getting it absolutely right. But what I also went to Antarctica to learn about was uh, climate change a little bit more removed from me to stop and take a look back at it from an international perspective. And the really simple articulations of, of climate change and how it's changing things already that you find in Antarctica is the fact that Western Antarctica is warming along with the Arctic faster than anywhere else on the planet. So more warming means less sea ice. And less sea ice is great if you're into shipping, but not so great if you're krill. So krill is that little prawny thing that swims around that's like the basis of the food chain in Antarctica. Um, and krill feeds on the nutrients that are released from melting sea ice. And so when you have less sea ice, you have less krill. And if you're in a Delhi penguin, I have to put in a picture of penguins because they're so cute and people remember them. If you're in a Delhi penguin, um, if you don't have krill, you can't survive. And so the populations of these Adeli penguins, which are one of only two truly Antarctic species of penguins, are in sharp decline at the moment because there isn't enough krill, because the sea ice is melting, because it's the fastest warming part of the planet. And that also means there's less food for humpback whales. And that was, I have to say, one of the standout moments for me of this precious opportunity I got to go to Antarctica with the kind support of EPA and REPAC, who helped sponsor me to, to be part of this leadership program. Um, and what you start to realize is that, for me, this was a whole new take on climate justice. I have worked for the last 10 years on climate justice, human rights, climate change. It's how Edward de Cameron and I know each other for such a long time. And we've looked so much at the injustice of climate change on people and the connection between climate impacts and human rights. But when I went down to Antarctica, I got a whole new, new different angle on climate justice. So Antarctica doesn't have a population. There are no people. But it is also, just as we have the Paris Agreement for Climate Change, there's the Antarctic Treaty that, that, that supports and governs the, the, the Antarctic continent. And despite the fact that Antarctica doesn't produce any emissions, it is warming faster than anywhere else. So this injustice is really stark there, and it really brings home the fact that our little actions, every action we take here in Ireland, has this profound effect thousands and thousands of kilometers away, but in a part of the, con of the world that's keeping us cool, helping to regulate our temperature. But we know that we're starting to feel these impacts right here in Ireland. So one thing that I took from the agriculture session is um, nobody spoke about the risks that farmers are experiencing already due to climate. If you talk to a farmer now, he's actually going to be more passionate talking to you about how we survive that fodder crisis in the snow than he is going to be talking to you about greenhouse gas emissions. So that's my friend Sean. He had to carry small calves out of the snow during Storm Emma. And then last summer, he and his wife Michelle woke every morning to the sound of their cows bawling, crying in the yard because they were hungry. They were starving. That's a big part of the reality for farmers in Ireland, and that has to be part of the discussion. So when Edward said climate action is not about just about greenhouse gas emissions, I clap and yell and say, yes, climate change is about risk, it's about resilience, it's about inclusion, it's about creating a different kind of society than the one we're in now. And we cannot leave the risk side out of the conversation. In fact, for businesses, your key way in the door, and I think Edward would uh, agree with this, is to talk to them first about risk, because all businesses do risk assessment. It's not anything alien to them. So integrating climate into that risk assessment is a very natural thing for them to do. And that can be a better gateway, like plastic is often a gateway for p individuals to understanding climate change. Understanding risk and exposure to risk can be a really important gateway to businesses and even towns and local authorities to help them understand then what climate change means to them and how they can be part of the solution. So if you declare a state of emergency after a hurricane, a storm, a drought, a terrorist attack, 
it is understood that something happens as a result. That's why you, you, you say you're in an emergency. So an emergency, I was having great fun with the Oxford Dictionary once I got started. If you're having an emergency, it means it's serious, unexpected, and dangerous, and it requires immediate action. So we have announced that we have a climate and biodiversity emergency. I saw the emergency for biodiversity articulated in that really clear, linear way in Antarctica. I can come up with any number of other examples in Ireland at the National Biodiversity Conference. The curlew was, for me, the emblem of our, 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 the, the biodiversity that we're losing here in Ireland and, and a bird that I have a kind of a, a strong affiliation to. So this, we've now said we're in an emergency. We're losing species hand over fist. Our planet is warming. All the evidence is clear. Edward laid that all out to what the IPCC says. So now we have to do something about it. And that's really important. Mr. Bruton says he's going to do things, and he told us some of those. And some of those important things are setting a net zero emissions by 2050 target, revising our climate change laws, setting timelines and targets. But we also need a new model of leadership. And I learned a lot about different ways of leading on this ship in Antarctica, where I spent a month on a very small ship with 90 women. And no, there was no bitchiness, and there was no fighting. And there was no falling out because we set some rules of engagement before we got on that ship and we decided to work in a supportive and collaborative way and that we would try and figure out how we could help each other, that we would be kind to each other and that we would test out in that month a different way of leading. And so I have eight things here that I think are part of a new model of leadership. And these are the, this is the leadership that we need in Ireland, but we need also more, more um, broadly around the world to actually change the way we do things right now. So we need to set a vision. You can't get the public behind something if you don't paint a picture of what it is. Where are we going? What is the Ireland we want in 2050? What does it look like? What will it be like to live there? Yeah, we have to say that vision is going to be an Ireland that's resilient, it's going to have zero emissions, it's going to be more inclusive and more fair. We need laws. You need the rule of law, you need laws, you need regulations to make change. That's going to be important. Third thing, you need certainty. Business will not act without certainty. Investors will not shift the way that money is invested out of fossil fuels and into renewables if there is no certainty. That means you need the right policies and the right regulations in place. We need honesty. So we need to be honest with people about the risks that are facing our farmers, our water supplies, our food chains. We don't instill fear. Fear paralyzes people. But you do have to be honest. Um, then we're going to collaborate rather than dictate. Collaboration is one of the most powerful tools available to any leader. It means you have to share your power. It means you have to ask people for help. But it will change the way that you get things done. Then we're going to need a lot of bravery. Yeah? Courage to fail. Uh, courage to try new things. Courage to get it wrong. And then within that was going to go a whole lot of humility. Courage and humility. Yeah, think of any leader that you can think of that really has those two things going on. Number seven, then, is fairness. Justice and fairness will have to be at the heart of this transition. People say casually there'll be winners and losers. Winners and losers are real people. We need to make sure there's way more winners than losers and protect the people who potentially lose their livelihood. And we need diversity. That means men and women, young and old, disabled and not disabled. It means north, south, east, west. The, the diversity is going to be the only way we get the creativity that we need. And well, at the heart of all of this change are people. Can I just say right now, people are not stakeholders. I don't, I'm not a stakeholder. I'm a person. Uh, and I don't like to be called a stakeholder. And I feel like I'm just anonymous when you call me a stakeholder. So people are individuals. They're families. They're households. They're volunteers. They're members of clubs and societies. They're workers. They're business owners. We have to bring our message to people in the different ways that they live their life, in the places where they already are, where they're already volunteering time, where they're already busy. We tested this out in Plastic Free Can Sale. We said we'd go and we'd meet people where they already were. We wouldn't start up a new committee. We wouldn't create a new entity. We wouldn't create an NGO. We'd just start working with what was already there. And so we identified four broad stakeholder groups, but then applying that to group, not person. Um, and so we started with schools. And we set up a program called Plastic Free for Schools. And we've worked on this with ChangeX, with Paul and the guys, and with support of the Community Foundation. And we have now rolled out our program to 49 schools in Tipperary in the last two months. 
um, and it's available online for any school that wants to use it as a free resource on how to make your school a plastic free, how to make your school plastic free and to act as an ambassador for plastic free towns within your community. We worked with clubs. So if you are a busy work, working parent and you already spend your only free time volunteering for the GAA or the rugby club, I am not going to ask you to do something else. I want you to take this act, action, to your climate action, into that club. So in, in Kinsale, we had the first ever green open week in Ireland. It was zero waste, zero plastic, sustainable top to toe. And then when people are at home, again, one thing that we notice over and over again is people are time poor. So we have to get to them where they are at. So we have done heaps of stuff on social media. So that, for example, is an example of us taking the Joint Oireachtas report and boiling it down into simple language and doing a video conversation between myself and Madeleine to kind of unpack the thing. That will get to people who will never come to one of these conferences, but who do need to know about what the Joint Oireachtas report and climate action says. Um, and then we organize events. So Rosemary is here, um, Rosemary McSweeney, that we um, organized the She is Sustainable Cork event with. And this was an event that showcased, in that one, it was 100% women speakers. Um, and it was looking at sustainability in all walks of life. Over 200 people came more than that, way more than that wanted to come. So sustainability is, is really something that's time has come, it's, it's now. We we're, there is a zeitgeist out there and it's up to all of us that work in this space to make sure we don't lose it. And then we work with businesses. We've worked with businesses now as change by degrees in lots of different ways. And one of the key things that we're trying to do is change cultures and change behaviours within businesses. So we worked, for example, on changing behaviour with Musgrave. Um, we sat down with their marketing and um, marketing departments for Super Value and Centra. They were already doing lots of behavioural change around how they were buying. So they were asking lots of questions about the provenance of the food, what salt and sugar it had in there. But they wanted help to think about also how the packaging reflected their commitment to sustainability. And in doing this kind of behaviour change, you have to make sure that you're giving people capacity, that's the knowledge, so we brought in more knowledge about the types of packaging. The motivation, so we told them why it was important. We connected it to marine pollution, we connected it to the future that our children are going to live in. And then the opportunity was provided by the leadership within Musgraves to say this is important, we want you to do it, we want you to think about it. Then you start to get behaviour change. And so we are working with all players in society to make change one degree at a time towards, though, a compelling vision of what that better looks like, what change looks like. And I think I get asked all the time is, why do you bother changing one degree of the time? Why are you bothered with individuals when obviously we need systemic change? So like Edward, I worked a lot on the Paris Agreement. I worked a lot on the SDGs. I worked on all of the climate legal agreements we've made all the way through. And what I know is top down is really important. It's really, really powerful but so is bottom up. And I think that how we'll get systemic change in Ireland is by engaging every single citizen in a conversation that they feel part of in some way so that they will vote for systemic change. They will be supportive of the types of policies and laws we need to put into place. But until we have people making some little change in their life and feeling like they're part of something bigger, they will never be in support of systemic change. You know, they'll never be for changing our electricity system or our transport system. They won't be supportive of the dis disruption involved in digging up the roads to put in trams. So it, the individual actions matter because they power syst systemic change. And then if we can create that type of change going on within communities, within businesses, within schools, within broader society, we will get this type of collaboration that we need that will yield really long-term results. And I think that's where we all want to get to. So the best way to create the future is to imagine it. And I feel like quite often what's holding us back is we're not giving ourselves the freedom to think, what do we want? What do we want Ireland to be like in 2050? What do I want Ireland to be like in 2030 when Nathan is 18 years old? Nathan has no bother imagining a driverless car that's purely electric. Nathan has no bother imagining a world without newspapers. Nathan has no bother imagining a vegan burger. In fact, he thinks that's all really, really exciting. Yeah? Madeline did a test in the car this morning with her kids. Ask your kids to imagine the future, the 20 years from now, and they will give you the answer to what it's like. And it's all really exciting and it's all really good. Uh, I wrote a, an article um, a while back, oh, for International Women's Day, thanks to, to Kevin and to Sylvia in the Irish Times for, for publishing it, about uh, women and sustainability. 
And at the end of it, I quoted my daughter, who on a walk to school one day said, uh, yeah, no, mum, I would like to be the president. And I said, great, good, we need another woman president in Ireland. And she said, no, I want to be president of the world. Now you can just say, oh, yeah, right, that position doesn't exist right now. But the jobs of the future have not been created. We don't know what the jobs of the future are. So Lauren is entitled to be president of the world, to have that dream. Why, why shouldn't she? She's dreaming bigger than we as the grown-ups can dream. We see obstacles, kids don't see them. But then we need to be brave enough to put this new vision in place and we have to be brave enough to go for it. And I think that's what holds us back too. This is a quote from Dr. Brenny Brown that I love. We are desperately need more leaders who are committed to courageous, wholehearted leadership and who are self-aware enough to lead from their hearts rather than all involved, uninvolved leaders that lead from hurt and fear. Heart means thinking about others, it means thinking about yourself, it means thinking about your kids, it's about empathy, it's about love, it's about kindness, a whole lot of different things. So different can be better and fairer. Empathy informs behavior and behavioral change. And Christiana Figueres, who led the Paris Agreement and was with me for this month on the ship in Antarctica, her, her tagline, her way of doing things is stubborn optimism. You set yourself an optimistic goal and you just don't stop believing it. That, I think, is something we could all benefit from. Thank you.